Well, my name is Firuze Dumas, and I do want to thank you for, <laughs> thank you. I was lucky enough to be invited to Aspen two winters ago for the very first time. And I'll tell you, you people have everything here. I mean, you have the mountains, you have the trees, you have the rivers, you have the Louis Vuitton boutique, you have Goldie Hawn. But there was one thing noticeably absent, and I know you've noticed it, and I noticed it too, where are the Middle Easterners? Where, <laughs> where do you get a good falafel in downtown Aspen? Now, fortunately, the Aspen Summer Words has fixed this problem, although temporarily. And I'm very honored to introduce, would you guys like to join me on stage, please? Oh, you, have, you must, it's not an option. So I promise, come on, Osef. So I promise to keep this very brief. I'm just going to be introducing everybody quickly, and we get about three, five minutes to share a little story, whatever we'd like. Let me start with Osef here, because he's the closest one to me. Really? Yeah, you, really. Um, Osef Gavron is a, a very talented writer who joins us from Tel Aviv. Now, there's a lot I could say about him, but this is the one thing I want to say. Um, his, his last book, Almost Dead, um, to, is a very special book because he's taken a topic that is very black and white and written in the gray area. Uh, he wrote about an Israeli, about a Palestinian, and he got a lot of, of flack about, about taking that, that, that particular stand. But I want to say that, it, you know, in terms of long-term conflicts, that is truly where the solution is going to be found. And I really respect Osef for doing that. And although his book alone will not bring, bring, bring peace to the region, I think it's a, it's a link in a very important chain. But uh, world peace aside, he has also written extensi extensively about falafels. And I, I'm going to give him his time to tell him in his own words about his Middle East. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, actually, this is exactly my Middle East, or at least what I'm going to talk about now, the, the, the food. Um, some people... <clears throat> some people think uh, or claim that it's another form of, of uh, <clears throat> injustice or, or occupation that the Israelis have nationalized the falafel as their own, um, <clears throat> while it's originally Palestinian. But I think that it's, um, I think that actually it's something that, that we share, and, and, and the Arabs and the, the Israeli Jews um, it's it's something that we we both love, and actually maybe this is where the where where the roots of the peace can can start growing from. <laughs> now, when I was a, a young journalist in the local <coughs> newspaper in Jerusalem, local magazine in Jerusalem, I went to my editor and I told him that I want to write a weekly falafel review. <laughs> that there were <laughs> there were enough restaurant reviews that most people don't go to those restaurants. And uh, everyone eats falafel every week, and we, we need a weekly uh, uh, <clears throat> column about it. And, and he let me do it for two years. And I want to read a short piece that I translated today. I chose, uh, well, I chose a very short one, so I will not go, go too long. And also, I chose a, a, an Arab place in uh, East Jerusalem <clears throat> to, to show my solidarity and... Uh, <laughs> And, and love. So, 
This is the review of Samir Falafel, 11 Hanotzrim Street, East Jerusalem. Samir's falafel is all in all pretty conventional falafel place. Although one must remember that convention is not, bad, it is not a bad thing with regards to falafel. Located towards the end of Hanotzrim Street, it's one self-respecting falafel joint. Small, clean, and with a one-dimensional and equico, equico, equi, how do you say this word? <laughs> equivocal <laughs> menu. Only falafel and cold drinks. <laughs> exactly the way it should be. One of the advantages of Samir is that the shop is open on the Muslim holidays as well. Another is the cheap price, three shekels per portion, although the prices drop even further closer to the Damascus Gate. But the biggest advantage is the divine thick tchina that Samir pours generously on top of each portion. Lurking underneath this, this tchina is a rich, well-balanced combination of fresh salad and many green balls, expertly crushed from the outside in order to prevent the pita's explosion. The spice is inserted into the pita by long slices of fresh green chili pepper, and not as a sauce, an impressive method that injects the spicy blows straight into your head and prevents leaks and the falafel seller's known tendency to stick a big, a big lump of chili sauce at the base of the pita. <laughs> Ultimately, Samir is a little disappointing due to a shortcoming in one of the falafel portion's most basic elements, the taste of the falafel balls. <laughs> it is reasonable, but not more than that, even when compared to the Western city's falafel. And this prevents the whole portion from flying to the sky and belonging to the elite of Jerusalem falafels. Thank you, Asaf. By the way, his, his book that I mentioned, Almost Dead, is sold out here, but I recommend you go to your local bookstore or Amazon.com to, to purchase your commie, to co your, cop, your commie, your copy. It's the Alta dude here. It does strange things to me. Um, it's, it's, it's not the, I've had no alcohol. I've only had water. Okay. Ravi Alamadine. His last book, The Hakawadi, got the kind of reviews that we writers would pay for. And if you haven't read it, it's actually now available in paperback. And you know, this year, actually the foundation is running the bookstore. So feel free to buy books for gifts and anybody that, that you know. Um, but what I really admire Robbie for is that he is an openly gay writer. And you know, that's not such a big deal if you live in Manhattan or San Francisco, but in Lebanon, that is, that is a very big deal. And I know for a fact that he is a hero to many gay youth in Lebanon. And I only hope, yes. I only, I only hope that we will someday soon have an Iranian version of Robbie. Uh, although, <laughs> although, although, as uh, the president of Iran so famously said a few years ago, we don't have homosexuals in Iran, so maybe not. Uh, Robbie, would you like to share your Middle East with us? Uh, sure. Actually, I, I have to talk about his falafel. <laughs> uh, the best falafel in the world is this little store in Beirut. It is absolutely amazing. Now, you know, we, we're all, every country in the Middle East, including Israel, is proud of their falafel. And for in the Lebanese, we insist that, you know, the Palestinians think it's Palestinian, the Israelis think it's Israeli, but we all know that they are Lebanese. <laughs> <laughs> now, the best place is actually called Sahyoun which means Zionist, <laughs> in the middle of Beirut. <laughs> That's my Middle East. Uh, actually, I, I wanted to talk about uh, my Middle East, to talk about my grandfather, but I think that's not as interesting. Uh, my grandmother is much more interesting. Uh, I want to talk about uh, sort of women and the Middle East and the perception of women in the Middle East. Uh, it has been amazing to me uh, lately, uh, almost every Western country that my book came out in and I was interviewed, the usual response is uh, that I write uh, amazingly strong women characters. Uh, one went as far as to suggest that um, my uh, character of the book before this actually had a personality. True. 
Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I'm fascinated by this because uh, it is almost constantly mentioned, the strong women characters, yet no one in Lebanon or the Arab world ever mentions that fact. I do not know of a single Lebanese woman who does not actually believe that the uh, main character, the character that goes down into the underworld and screws the jinni and you know, does that, is not based on her. Uh, so this dichotomy of how it is perceived and how we are perceived is 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 fascinating to me, uh, and it goes back to my grandmother, who's uh, 94 I think now, and uh, she intimately believes that she is the best bridge player in Lebanon, if not the world. <laughs> uh, and you know she might be. The only trouble that I have with her is I've tried to interview her a number of times to you know, get her story. She's 94, you know. Uh, and unfortunately, she cannot go for more than 30 seconds without mentioning that she is the best bridge player in <laughs> Lebanon. Uh, and so it, it's funny to me how different uh, we all are, you know, how different our perceptions of who we are. Yet when I talk about my grandmother, uh, everybody comes and says, well, my grandmother is the same, you know, she does this and this and this. Uh, so it's not just that we're both different and at the same time um, human. Um, I jokingly say that, you know, humans have 95% of their DNA the same as chimps. So could you just imagine what we as humans have in common? Uh, and if you ever try that on somebody as a pickup line, that, you know, <laughs> I have 95% in common with chimps. Could you just imagine what we have? It doesn't work. <laughs> I've tried that. I'm not sure even what to say to introduce Khaled Hosseini, but let me just say this, and we're gonna talk about more this, about this tomorrow, so I hope you're able to come. But when Khaled's first book hit the New York Times, it was very exciting for me, because we were friends, and, and it was the strangest thing, because it hit the New York Times, and it just stuck. And you know, most writers sort of measure their book, they say, you know, I was on it for five weeks, or maybe 12 weeks, or gosh, maybe 20 weeks. But Khaled's books actually were measured by years on the New York Times bestseller list. And I remember at one point sort of thinking, well, doesn't everybody in the world have a copy? Who is he selling to? And then I realized he was selling to the unborn. <laughs> so I... <laughs> but here's something just between me and you. Uh, he's really a doctor. So this, you know, few, next few days, you don't have to limit your conversations with him to just about literature. Feel free to ask him for medical advice as well. <laughs> Khaled? Oh, thank you. No, um, I'm going to tell a story about how I married my wife. But before I do, I just want to, because I, I probably won't get another chance, I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to be here. I want to thank the Aspen Writers Foundation for inviting my wife, myself, and my children here. And especially, I want to say what a tremendous, unmitigated pleasure it's been to mingle with my fellow writers uh, who are sitting on stage with me here, the ones who are not, who are in the, out in the audience. I've learned something from all of you and your panels, and it's just truly an honor to be um, with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> as Firuza said, I, I was in another life a physician, and um, in uh, 1993, I was a physician at the lowest point possible in the career, meaning I was an intern uh, at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. And um, I happened to have a weekend off, which I, I'm not sure how it happened, but I had a weekend off and I decided to go from Los Angeles to where my family lived in San Jose to visit my folks. So I fly up without announcing, it, so they didn't know it was a surprise visit. I, uh, I fly up and there's like 50 cars in front of my father's house and I immediately know it's an Afghan party because um, that's how they live. So um, I walk in and there's a party and we're talking and in the middle of this party, I, uh, I spot this unbelievably beautiful uh, young woman and immediately I'm completely smitten. So um, I, uh, you know, I started making my way towards her and my best friend, his name is Farhad, I saw that he was starting to make his moves 
you know, and he's like kind of angling himself to talk to her. And, uh, and, I, and I walked up to him and I looked at him in the eyes and I said, you need to step away. You know, <laughs> this, this is going to end badly for you. <laughs> so he stepped away. So I walked up to my wife, Roya, uh, and I started talking to her. And we talked for like an hour and I was completely just blown away by her because she was not only just strikingly beautiful, but she was amazingly smart and insightful and funny and engaging. And it was like an hour just flew by. And after about an hour of talking, I noticed that all the guests are kind of staring at us. You know, like, what's going on here? You know, two unmarried Afghan people talking. What's the deal? <laughs> so, you know, I stepped away out of respect. And, uh, and, and then Arroyo and her folks eventually went home that evening. And it was, that was a Saturday. And on Sunday, um, I flew back to Los Angeles. And Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I couldn't stop thinking about her. I mean, I was completely, she occupied my every thought. And I decided, you know, that either I'm, I'm going to call her or I'm going to go insane. So eventually, I called my sister and I said, you have to give me Roya's phone number. I have to give her a call. So my sister, who actually was kind of friends with Roya, gave me Roya's number. And um, I called uh, Roya's house. She lived with her folks at the time. And every time I called, her father picked up the phone. And he turned out to be this total teddy bear of a man, but he has this very deep voice. And he scared the shit out of me every time. <laughs> So I'm calling, he's picking up the phone, I'm hanging up. I call, he picks up the phone, I hang up. <clears throat> and this was the days before caller ID, thank God. And eventually, eventually, Roya answered the phone. And, um, you know, and we kind of had this very awkward, bumbling conversation, at the end of which I made what amounted to a proposal, which was something along the lines of, Roya, this is an honorable phone call, <laughs> you know, and I would like to ask for your hand in marriage. Um, and uh, Roya was like, well, um, why don't you give me some time, you know? And I said, well, how's 15 minutes, you know? <laughs> and she said, okay, let me talk to my folks. And she hung up the phone, and Roya went and, and talked to her folks. And uh, 15 minutes later, I called back, uh, really anxious. And Roya said, you know, it's fine. I think it's okay, <laughs> you know? And um, so I called my parents, and I said, you won't believe what I've just done, but I've just proposed to the Kayumi's daughter, uh, Roya, and uh, I would like for you guys to go over there and ask for her hand. So I heard this explosion of cheers in the background. They were so excited because they love her. And so they got into a van and got some of the family elders, and they drove to Roya's house. And I'm in Los Angeles. They're in Northern California. And I'm pacing my apartment. It's like 1 in the morning by now, and I'm wondering what happened. And um, my father called me back. And, uh, and said, you know, that, that they had agreed. Um, and so I flew back. Uh, the next day I was at work. This was Thursday. And I went to my boss. Her name was Jackie. And I said, Jackie, I got engaged. And I got to go home tomorrow because we're having an engagement party on Saturday. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of people. And Jackie goes, look, how long have you known? I'm like, you know, I just met her on Saturday. <laughs> and I'm and she said, I've been with Bill for 14 years, and I can't make up my mind still. <laughs> You're like my hero. You know? So I, I went back home on Friday, and uh, Roy and I got engaged on Saturday. And it was like the, her parents threw a party for 200 people, which they like arranged essentially on the spur of the moment. And then we got married like six weeks later, and there were over 500 people at the wedding, a good 100 of which were wedding crashers, which happens in Afghan parties. Um, and that was back in 1993. And, and then we have two kids, and we've been marrying for 18 years. And that was the single best decision I've ever made, because Roya is not only my friend, not only my, 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 my partner in life, she's also my editor. She's edited <laughs> both The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons before I ever sent it to the publisher. She's an amazingly talented editor. And I'm firmly convinced that were it not for Roya, I would not be here today. So love you forever, Roya. Thank you for everything. Roya, you have to stand up. Roya, you have to stand up. You have to stand up. Thank you, Khaled. You know, I, I have to say that um, my husband proposed to me on our third date, and I always thought that was kind of a world record. And then I go out with Khaled and he tells me that story and I thought he beat me there too. So, thank you. Um, our next, <clears throat> excuse me.
excuse me, our next writer, Mona al -Tahawi. Let me just say this. Uh, a year and a half ago, when I agreed to help in a very small way with this, uh, with this festival, I suggested Mona. And I think the, the organizers weren't quite familiar with her. And I said, look, trust me, you, know, you may not have heard of Mona el Tahawi today, but you will hear of her. And I'm telling you, inviting her a year ago was like buying Cisco stock in 1990. <laughs> and I know you people understand that. The writers don't. But you know, I can't tell you how much I admire Mona. She is just one of the bravest women I know. <laughs> she, are, you, are you clapping for her or Cisco, for Cisco stock? I'm not sure which. But, she, she is so brave, and, and I have learned so much from her. And I'm just telling you this as a warning. Never, ever, ever agree to debate Mona. You will not win. And I have seen her, you know, when uh, the revolution happened in Egypt. She was on every single TV, I mean, every show. Every, I mean, she just was, it was all Mona all the time. And I was so, so proud to just be constantly hearing her wise words and and I just think this is really the beginning for Mona, so. Thank you, Fayouza. I don't know what's harder, to be compared to Cisco shares or to follow Khalid's amazing story, so <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, my Middle East has to do with Arabic and the power of words, seeing as this is the Summer Words Festival. My parents tell me that I started to read the newspapers when I was four, so I, I've been a news junkie my entire life, so obviously Arabic was my mother tongue, but we moved to London when I was seven. And even though I went to an English school in Cairo, it was just the kind of English school where you learn English in the classroom and, and in the playground, you speak Arabic. So when I moved to London at the age of seven, I remember the first day I went downstairs to play with the kids, you know, close to where we lived. I had very short hair, I had a very androgynous look, and the kids just couldn't figure out what or who I was. So they would say, are you a boy or a girl? Uh, what, where are you from? What are you? And I had no words for them. And I just ran home in tears. And I told my mother, I can't talk to these kids. I can't play with them and I can't talk to these kids. And she said, you know, you'll be talking English soon enough and they haven't been able to stop me since mm -hmm. because within a few weeks I was speaking English. And so English took over and English became my primary language. And at home, of course, as with many immigrants, our parents would speak to us in Arabic and my brother and I would, would reply in English. And every weekend, the, my parents' routine was they would put on the cassette tapes of their favorite singers, favorite Egyptian singers, and the house would just be overtaken with this huge cloud of nostalgia. And one of their favorite singers is, was an Egyptian man called Abdel Halim Hafiz, who was a great singer of love songs in Egypt. And there was this one particular song called Sawah, which means the wanderer, and it's this great song about um, being abroad, being in exile, tell me how my love is doing abroad. My parents would, would listen to the song and I, could, I was overwhelmed with the nostalgia and missing Egypt because all I wanted to do was listen to the radio and listen to my pop, pop music, basically. And I was like, why do they keep putting on this sad music every weekend? I just couldn't stand it and I couldn't understand it. I was seven, what did nostalgia mean to me? But then you fast forward, I think it was 20 years later or something, and I'm in Cairo and in a cab, and we're stuck in notorious Cairo traffic, and the same song comes on, and my eyes just are filled with tears, and I'm crying in the back of this cab, and the driver thinks I'm insane. And I realized at that moment, the power of words, the power of nostalgia, I realized what my parents, and what my parents were feeling and what my parents were reaching out for, what my parents loved, and, and the gift that my parents had given me that I was so reluctant to take. And so, very soon after, I fell in love with this jewelry maker whose jewelry I have basically dedicated my body to. <laughs> because, and I see her and I tell her this, I tell her, you know, I've dedicated my body to you, and, and it's my goal in life to get her to endorse me. <laughs> so I'm putting together a videotape to show her how I wear her jewelry everywhere. But that's another story. But, but the reason that I love her jewelry is because it's a chance for me to carry the power of words and to carry the beauty of that Arabic that my parents reached out for every weekend in London and that, that I seemed to reject for such a long time, but, but the beauty of which finally struck me in that Cairo cab. And one of the first pieces that I got from her was from my first and basically only Egyptian boyfriend <laughs> who got me a ring when I turned 30 that just so in beautifully encapsulated words and ideas like love and passion 
And very soon afterwards, I got these, these bangles here. And so my Middle East is the power of words, and I, I'm going to translate some of what these bangles say because that's, it's the reason why I've dedicated my body to her jewelry. This big, this big bangle here, ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> this big bangle here at the bottom is Om Kulthum lyrics. Thank you, Reza. And Om Kulthum lyrics, like Abdul Halim Haka's lyrics and other lyrics, are often poetry that is then sung. And this one says, it's better for this heart to beat and in the flames of passion to burn. And then the one above it says, basically the equivalent of this too shall end. This one here is poetry by an Egyptian poet called Salah Jahim. And he says, um, let's see, because I often forget what it says and I have to remind myself. If my sin is that your love is my master, then every night of every lover is full of sin. And then this ring here, which often catches people's eye, says, Ya um, Mufatah al Abwab, which in Arabic means open doors, oh, oh you who opens doors. So it's invo an invocation to God, the powers that be, to open doors for you. And the same thing with the other rings. And every piece that she makes, thank you, Reza, is either Sufi sayings or popular poetry or lyrics. But it's such a celebration of this language now that I realize is such a deep part of my soul. Where I hear the opening of Arabic music. I hear Om Kulsum sing. I hear Abdul Halim Hafiz sing. And it touches such a deep part of my soul. And it took me a long time to understand the power of that, that moment in the Cairo, in the Cairo cab. Because for such a, a large part of my life, it was all about English and it was all about the immigrant exile experience as it is for so many bicultural, tricultural kids. But Arabic is so precious to me, and especially in the US after 9-11, where Arabic became just the language of hate. Osama bin Laden, those endless fucking statements from Osama bin Laden that used to drive me nuts. And he was taking this language that was so precious and, and so touched my soul, and it was not his. It was mine. And so I wear this jewelry because wherever I go now, people say, oh, I love that artwork. And I say, it's not just art, it's my language. That's my Middle East. Yes, okay. Whenever anything strange happens in Iran, which is like every other Tuesday, uh, <laughs> whose photogenic face do you see on television trying to explain what is happening, what is going to happen, what should have happened, and what might happen? Reza Aslan. Uh, Reza is from my country. I need to... I <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, Reza is, is your classic overachiever. He has a, a bunch of degrees. He, he's an as associate professor. He is a writer of huge bestsellers. He is a commentator. He also has a company now, a multimedia company called BoomGen. Is that right? Yeah, BoomGen. Where, I mean, he's, he, you know, he's like our, our Rupert Murdoch. He is unstoppable. Well, actually, one thing. His wife is about to give birth to twins. So, uh -huh. Reza? Yes, indeed. Yes, my, uh, my wife is about to give uh, birth to twin boys, and both of them have copies of the Kite Runner. <laughs> it's true. Very true. Uh, my, <laughs> my, uh, my uh, story of the, my Middle East story actually uh, takes place right here in Aspen, uh, actually uh, at a tent. Uh, about 100 yards uh, behind us. Uh, this was the Aspen Ideas Festival in 2006. And by the way, I've been asked to tell this story. Uh, this was 2006. If you recall, President Bush had just been reelected. Uh, there was a civil war in Iraq uh, that was um, threatening to spill to the rest of the region. Afghanistan was a, a complete mess that we, everybody was ignoring. Um, uh, you know, this was also the, the, the height of Bush's uh, democracy promotion. Remember that? Uh, that went well. And uh, <laughs> this, uh, it was immediately after um, 
elections in, Hez uh, in uh, Lebanon led to enormous electoral gains by Hezbollah. Uh, elections in the Palestinian territories uh, led to uh, enormous uh, electoral gains uh, by Hamas, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a, it was a very important time for people who make their living talk about, talking about the Middle East. So I was invited to the Aspen Ideas Festival uh, and given sort of this plum role, uh, I had like four or five different talks that I was giving um, about sort of the issues involving the Middle East. And then I was also given the, uh, the honor to kick off the entire festival. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Aspen Ideas Festival, I don't even actually know if they still do this, but it, it starts with this one evening called, you know, um, what's the big idea? I think it's what they call it. And basically they invite four or five of the, the you know, hundreds of speakers uh, to kick off the entire festival uh, with a quick five minute talk uh, about sort of a big idea. What's the big idea? So I went up there and I gave this talk. I said, well, as many of you know, uh, there, were, there was a, uh, an, an election quite recently uh, in the Middle East that brought a, a party to power, a party w whose roots are uh, in terrorism, uh, a party that uh, rejects the two-state solution, a party, of course, uh, that doesn't even acknowledge the existence of the other, let alone accept the other's nationalist uh, aspirations. A party whose founding charter uh, rejects uh, any possibility of coexistence with the other. I'm, of course, speaking of the Likud party. <clears throat> yeah, this was kind of the response that I got from the, from the 5,000 people in the audience. Just this awkward, uh, and some hissing. There was some hissing, uh, a lot of hissing. Uh, that I was making another point back then about, you know, if we're actually going to take democracy seriously, let's take it seriously. Of course, we weren't going to take it seriously at the time, but the larger reason why I'm bringing this story up is because, um, you know, we're storytellers. And stories are not just things that you read in books. Stories are how we understand the world. Religion is just storytelling. Politics is just storytelling. And how you tell the story informs the way that we understand the story. Everything that I just said is true about the Likud party. It's also true of Hamas. But changing the characters radically transforms the way we even think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or, for that matter, anything else that's going on uh, in the world around us. And that's something that I've always sort of taken very much to heart, you know. I mean, you know, I, I, the reason I sort of work in different fields is because in the end, I think of all of that as just different forms of telling stories. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what I, what I want to kind of emphasize tonight is, is the power of words and, and the power of stories to, sh to shape the way that we understand the world. There's a coda to this, uh, to this particular story. Uh, the next morning at breakfast, um, I ran into Linda Resnick. Now, some of you know, of course, the great Linda Resnick, the billionaire uh, marketing genius behind Palm Wonderful and Fiji Water and et cetera, and, and obviously uh, not just a patron of, of the Aspen Ideas Festival, but one of the sort of founding patrons of the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, and someone who, by the way, I've like uh, worshipped from afar for a very long time because anyone who can convince me to pay $7 for a bottle of water is a genius. Um, so I, I had this opportunity to, to sort of, you know, go up to her and, and say hi, and I sort of tapped her on the shoulder, and I said, uh, hi, uh, Ms. Resnick, I'm, I'm Reza Aslan, and she goes, darling, I know who you are. All my friends think you're an anti-Semite, but I think you're fabulous. <laughs> and that was the last time I was invited to the Aspen Ideas Festival. <laughs> Thank you, Reza. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Muinuddin, help me, Daniel. Muinuddin. Okay, yes, that. Uh, <laughs> an unfairly talented writer. In 2010 alone, he won the Story Prize and was a finalist for the National Book Award, 
the LA Times Book Prize, and a little something called the Pulitzer. <laughs> However, let's put those aside for a moment. What I really love about Danielle is that he is a Yale Law School graduate and is now running a mango farm in Pakistan. Um, my only gripe with you... It's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> my only gripe with you is you didn't bring any mangoes with you, but for next time. So, Danielle? Um, yeah. Uh, so, when these folks told me that I should write about my Middle East, I thought that they've extended the geography of the Middle East far past uh, what I would expect it to ex extend to, because I'm from Pakistan. And then I looked at my wife and said, do they really expect me to talk about Dubai Airport? But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, that didn't seem wise. Um, so uh, then I started thinking about what really is my Middle East. And um, uh, unfortunately, I mean, you know, f for Pakistan, I think um, the middle, our relationship with the Middle East has been a fraught one. I mean, obviously, we share a religion and, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's a source of great you know, uh, succor and strength to our people and to us. But, um, but, but in fact, what we've been seeing coming from the Middle East is two things. One is that the, uh, because of uh, the, the Israeli uh, presence in the Middle East and the, the, the in, in fact, you know, in America's identification with Israel, therefore, in Pakistan, uh, there is a tremendous uh, uh, sort of anti-Israeli sentiment, which then extends to an uh, anti-Western sentiment, and I think that doesn't work very well for us. I think that, in fact, we should be embracing uh, sort of Western democratic ideas, and we don't. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not being funny. <laughs> um, and so that's one thing. So th I'm sorry for that. And the other thing is that I think that, um, and, uh, and the other thing is that, uh, that we've been uh, receiving from the Middle East, and especially primarily, I guess, from Saudi Arabia, uh, the, these, this uh, Wahhabi Muslim influence, which has been, is, is what is, uh, you know, this money that is coming to make our, uh, uh, to, to build madrasas and to, to uh, radicalize our country. And therefore, I mean, unfortunately at the moment, our, I mean, when I think of, my Middle East, I don't think of a happy relation. And so I guess I would just say that I hope that we can, that we as writers and uh, uh, you know, those of us uh, both in the Middle East and in Pakistan who are able to can make a better connection in the future. Hi, I just uh, came in this afternoon, so I haven't had a chance to meet everyone, but from what I can gather, and Daniel also just talked about making connections. So I want to start with a, a connection uh, to Mona's body. Um, <laughs> she may not know, maybe, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to see if you were paying attention, no. Um, so you're talking about the words on, on your wrist. So I've just finished, uh, I just published a book with my wife about a thing called the Cairo Geniza. I won't go into what that is, but except to say that's a stash, a uh, cache of medieval manuscripts that were found in a Kyrene synagogue, the largest um, collection of manuscripts, of Jewish manuscripts ever found. And one of the strange things that emerged from this was that um, Jewish Egyptian women in the 10th, 11th century, and probably also uh, Egyptian Muslim women, wore, um, and men too, um, wore gowns where they had poems embroidered on their sleeves. Which is to say, kind of when I found this out, it sort of gave new meaning to wearing your heart on your sleeve. Uh, very much like you have now uh, on your bracelet. So you're just continuing that tradition in a wonderful fashion. Um, <clears throat> what I really wanted to uh, uh, say about my Middle East is um, I wanted to begin with something that, um, like me, has absolutely nothing to do with the Middle East and also everything uh, to do with the Middle East. Um, the Viennese philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said, that the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Now, I was born in, and raised in suburban New Jersey. Need I say more? Very early on, I understood the limits of my world. And so, about 32 years ago, at the age of 22, for odd reasons, uh, I took off for uh, Jerusalem, Israel, to learn Hebrew in order to become an American poet. 
uh, and that worked. I also acquired Arabic, and uh, I have lived in Jerusalem for the better part of the past um, 30 years, writing poems in English, translating from Arabic and from Hebrew, medieval, and modern. But for all that time, I don't represent Israel, and I don't represent Palestine, and I don't represent America, because I feel that the sense of place uh, that I've been engaged with all this time uh, is really very much of a verbal space in which these different cultures that matter so much to me, Hebraic and Arabic and European and English, um, come together and if all goes well, form sort of new and vital literary compounds that might go beyond the notion of a country and certainly of a political boundary. Now, Nowhere is that sense, that fertile ethos of East-West hybridization um, more powerfully embodied than it is in the culture of Muslim Spain or Al-Andalus. And the finest description of that Andalusian attitude that I've ever encountered was offered up by the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, who said, <laughs> I, I have it in my head somewhere, but I know I'll forget it. Don't read it. So, he said, Al-Andalus might be here or there or anywhere, a meeting place of strangers in the project of building human culture. It is not only that there was a Jewish-Muslim coexistence, but that the fates of the two people were similar. Al-Andalus for me, is the realization of the dream of the poem. So with all that in mind, I'd like to introduce into this mix, this very rich mix, a Middle Eastern poem that was written at the western edge of Europe. It's a medieval poem that's always new. Um, it's an Arab style, very much of an Arabic poem that was written by a Jew in Hebrew. And I'll read it in for you now in uh, my translation. Um, and I think you'll see that it applies really to all of us, east and west, then and now. Um, the poet's name is Shmuel Hanagid, Shmuel is Samuel in Hebrew. Uh, and he also had an Arabic name, Ismael Ibn Nagrela. And almost impossibly, he was all at once the Nagid or the leader of Iberian Jewry in the 11th century. He was the military commander, the commander of the Muslim army of Grenada. And he was Grenada. And he was also eventually the prime minister of this city-state of Grenada under its Muslim king. Um, and the poem I'm going to read is called The Market. On top of all his other roles, he was, in my opinion, the greatest or one of the greatest Hebrew poets of all time. And that's a time that includes the authors of the Book of Psalms and Job and Ecclesiastes. And Erica and I were talking over dinner. This is a man whose work was basically lost soon after he died and was only recovered in the early 20th century and published for the first time in a readable version in the 1940s. So he's a 20th century poet, as you'll hear. And this is about a Middle Eastern market in Spain. I crossed through a market where butchers hung oxen and sheep side by side. There were birds and herds of fatlings like squid, their terror loud as blood congealed over blood and slaughterers' knives opened veins. In booths alongside them, the fishmongers, in fish in heaps, in tackle like sand. And beside them, the street of the bakers, whose ovens are fired through dawn. They bake, they eat, they lead their prey. They split what's left to bring home. And my heart understood how it happened and asked, who are you to survive? What separates you from these beasts, which were born a new waking and labor and rest? If they hadn't been given by God for your meals, they'd be free. If he wanted this instant, he'd easily put you in their place. They've breath like you and hearts, which scatter them over the earth. 
There was never a time when the living didn't die, nor the young that they bear not give birth. Pay attention to this, you pure ones, and princes so proud in your fame. Know if you fathom the worlds of the hidden, this is the whole of man. Thank you. Okay, now I have all the microphones. <laughs> it's a metaphor. Okay, but anyways, um, that was Peter Cole. Thank you. One thing I, I did wanted to say about translators, uh, but Peter took the microphone before I had a chance, is that in Iran, in pre-revolutionary Iran, uh, we read the literature of authors from France and England and Russia and so many countries, and we depended, of course, on the talent of translators. And I, we, we in Iran really respect translators because without their very rare talent, the, all these ideas would never reach us. And, you know, p people like Peter are, are so rare, and the fact that you translate poetry, which is really the hardest thing there is to, to translate. So, Peter, you are a smart man. Um, and... Uh, Lastly, I just wanted to say that for me, my Middle East is really about oral storytelling. <clears throat> I come from a family of oral storytellers. My only talent has been in writing them down and therefore being invited to places like Aspen. Um, and what's really fabulous about storytelling, about listening to somebody's first-person story or reading somebody's first-person story, is that you form a connection with that person, you valid that, validate that person, and somehow you also validate your own existence. And I think it's really ironic today because we have so many methods of, trans of communication, but really people aren't really sharing their stories anymore. So I just encourage all of you, whenever you have a chance to sit down and, and ask someone to tell you their story. I do want to, on behalf of all the writers on stage, thank all of you for supporting this wonderful program. You know, without people who bought Cisco stock in 1990 and who then shared it with uh, this conference, none of us would be here today. And <laughs> So thank you to each and every one of you. And I just want to say quickly that I have never seen people like Lisa and Natalie and Lauren and Sarah and Jamie. These are the hardest working people, and they're such perfectionists. I mean, you are very lucky to have them here in Aspen. Um, all, of us, all of us here on stage are plotting ways to get invited back. And I just want to say that when a bunch of Middle Easterns get together and plot, watch out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>